Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today is Richard Cohen. He has been an advocate for legalized marijuana for most of my life. He wants to educate his generation to the many and amazing benefits of hemp-based medicine. He's teamed up with Dr. Igor Bussell, I hope I got that right, to give seniors valuable information from a medical professional and a lifelong help hemp, excuse me, and marijuana activist. Together they have CBD seniors and blue ribbon hemp. So thank you for joining me, Richard. My pleasure. Thank you. So My pleasure. Bef before we discuss how CBD can help with Alzheimer's, let's talk about everyday life issues that can also affect our brains, specifically like weight gain and, and insomnia so actually, I should back up and let you t introduce yourself a little bit more. Apparently, my brain's not working today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I ju have just the cure. Uh, Good. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, first off, I always you know, emphasize at the beginning, I, you know, I'm not a doctor. I just play one on the internet. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and seriously now, folks, my point is not... I've been involved in the marijuana reform movement and then I found out about medical marijuana and so on. But I have never, you know, prescribed, you know, suggested anybody use cannabis for a medical purpose because I'm not, you know, a, a doctor. I'm not, a, you know, a, that is my degree is in economics. Uh, and my, which is, it, well, it would make you need marijuana anyway. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, my point has always been a, about freedom, that people should be free. And this was the, the thing that really was so frustrating until just very recently is that, and you still encounter it, the, the, the prohibitionist party line is sort of, no medicine is smoked. Uh, you know, it's basically, oh, of course I'm not opposed to medical cannabis, as long as it's been developed by the pharmaceutical industry and approved by the FDA and you know, and then, you, uh, well, uh, you know, thank you. But, and then of course, oh, we don't need it anymore. Well, excuse me, does that mean you're admitting that we used to need it and you are arresting sick people? So th this is, you know, my approach to this thing has always been, you know, that, you know, number one, freedom. And then in terms of, you know, when looked at, the CBD business and how it was shaping up. Uh, I just turned 80 and I, uh, uh, you know, this may be a plug uh, for marijuana in the sense that I am 80, I do not take any prescription drugs. Uh, I have uh, been uh, using cannabis on a basically daily basis for the last 50 some odd years. Uh, and so everybody will have to, you know, judge for themselves uh, for how it's affected me. But the fact is, is that I, you know, I'm on the other hand, you know, I'm very fortunate in terms of genetics. Uh, there are a lot of things that are illnesses that are genetic, and apparently including Alzheimer's, if I you know, understand it. Uh, but the fact is that, you know, the the stress the problems that everybody faces as, as, as we get older. And it may be at 60 or 70 or 80 or 90. I mean, there's, you know, there are people that, uh, you know, are still going strong, uh, you know, in their nineties. And that is, uh, like Mel Brooks, uh, who is, you know, <laughs> just still as funny as ever and just as sharp as ever. Uh, but you know, you don't, you, you know, it's, also, I always say you were all subject to cancellation without notice. So, you know, we, we, this, this is something that whether or not, you know, people have, are having to deal with the extreme stress of, of Alzheimer's, that as, as we age, uh, different things are uh, going wrong with our bodies. And in that regard, cannabis seems to be you know, something that in the old days we would have called a tonic. Uh, uh, I called it gin. But <laughs> you know, the, the idea is, does it you know, uh, help, you know, just in terms of everyday life? And unlike 
uh, THC whole cannabis, uh, there is there are no uh, uh, there's no high out uh, in, involved in, in using CBD. And, uh, you know, as I say, I've, you know, I've been getting high for 50 some odd years. So, you know, the dull joke, you know, it, it worked for me. But, uh, I, you know, again, uh, I know people that, that simply do not enjoy that. Uh, I know a lot more people who are frightened by the idea or may have religious objections to it or, or whatever. But, you know, that's, that's one thing. But, you know, the fact is, is that, that, uh, that there are people that just find the THC high very uncomfortable. And so, uh, you know, and I think uh, that, ironically, uh, CBD really helps with that. Uh, <laughs> that's and, funny. Well, it really, I mean, it really is. It, you know, I've, uh, th there have been some recent studies about, you know, people who have problems. With, some people... You know, the idea, and I think this is something that's probably worth dealing with here, is the idea of people, is marijuana addictive? Well, yes, everything is addictive in the sense that, uh, you know, if you, you know, uh, different things that you like to do, of course, you know, gambling uh, is highly addictive. There is, it is one of the most destructive addictions of, of any, so, uh, because there's a limit to how much cocaine you can put up your nose, but there is no limit to the amount of money that the casinos will happily take. Uh, you know, they'll, you know, until you're around on money, they'll take it. Uh, but, you know, this is, there is, you know, this isn't something where you're taking something. Uh, this is an action that you're, that has become a fixation, but it is as addictive as, uh, or more so than, than many drugs. And you know, addiction from alcohol, uh, which may be my favorite drug, uh, can be fatal. Uh, that uh, DTs, you, people can have actually go in and, and have seizures and die. Uh, the barbiturates are highly addictive. And you know, if they will, in fact, if you go into DTs, the hospital, though, they will give you barbiturates to stop, uh, stop the convulsions and keep you from dying. Uh, and so the you know, the, the point is, is that what, you know, in terms of do people, do some people have problems with, you know, with cannabis use? Yeah. Uh, but people have problems with almost everything. And you know, th that's, that, you know, whatever, you know, people say, oh, that couldn't happen. I say, if there are people involved, it can happen. That's I mean, true. People, yeah. uh, but the general idea, though, of, of dealing with stress, which is, uh, both for the uh, families of people with Alzheimer's and with the patients themselves. And uh, this is uh, the, so the, they are being two entirely different sets of facts that you, you have the patient who's, you know, in the grips of a terrible degenerative disease. And then you have the families and friends who are trying to take care of it. the, uh, one of the things that I have recently learned about uh, that, uh, and I've had two fascinating stories about, is uh, cannabis, uh, not cannabis, excuse me, music and Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. That, uh, talking to a friend the other day that had a, 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 a family with Alzheimer's, very severe, curled up in a ball. And so they get him to, uh, you know, stand, you know, basically pick him up, just hold on to him and then put him in front of the piano and put his hands on the keys. And then it comes back to him. Apparently it's a different part of the brain or whatever. It comes back to it and he starts playing the piano perfectly. And then after he has finished playing the piano, he gets up and walks by himself back to where he was sitting. And, I, I uh, you know, over the years I've heard about music therapy and I had a, a, a friend's daughter actually had a degree in it and I heard some amazing stories, but, you know, the idea that somebody is so locked up with Alzheimer's that suddenly, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, come out of it at least a little bit uh, uh, just through the power of music. And, you know, I, I think that, that one of the things that we're going to be seeing a lot more of 
in the, the era ahead is an emphasis on music for healing because right now we need a lot of healing. I mean, okay. yeah. America and the world is in a world of hurt and the, uh, and which, you know, it, it's difficult enough. I mean, I'm so blessed that for me, uh, you know, this has been a major inconvenience and I resent it terribly. But the fact is, is that, you know, aside from the fact it's killing a lot of people, uh, the, the pandemic itself, the lockdown and the loss of businesses and the isolation uh, is for many people uh, just a, a huge burden in many ways. And if these people are then trying to deal with you know, uh, severely, you know, dementia uh, related issues with a family or loved one that, you know, it's, I cannot imagine uh, that on top of everything else. And of course, the patients, or the, the people with Alzheimer's, if, if, if they are in later stages, but still aware, they pick up on the vibes, the negative, you know, the, the stress and everything around them. Uh, and so, I think that the, uh, there is going to be a major role for uh, the use of cannabis in the general context, uh, and particularly of, of CBD, in the general context of dealing with stress. And, the, the, you know, and this, as I say, I cannot imagine anything more stressful than trying to care for a loved one with, with you know, advanced Alzheimer's. I, I, uh, you know, there, there hasn't been any of it in my family, but, you know, you, you, you know, as people, as, as, you know, as my, my father got older, you know, he, uh, <laughs> my father lived to be 81. He was a hundred pounds overweight folk, smoked four packs of cigarettes a day and could polish off a bottle of gin and get up the next morning and be, <laughs> uh, uh, that, uh, but he lived to be 81 and, uh, uh, basically was in good health till about the year before he died. Uh, Some uh, robust you know, he genetics. Said, you have marijuana, uh, you have marijuana and I have martinis. So. <laughs> well, I like M&Ms. <laughs> yeah. You were saying, you know, people, me too, me too. people are concerned that, you know, marijuana is addictive and it's like, I think, like you said, everything is kind of addictive because I know most evenings, sitting down, watching TV, reading a book, whatever, relaxing. And my brain goes, hmm, must be time for something sweet. And it's like, yeah, uh, no, we don't, we should have had that hours ago so we could burn it off. But I always give in or almost always give in because, <laughs> you know, well, I like chocolate. So what the heck? You know? yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, <laughs> I will not recommend my brownie recipe. <laughs> uh, well, Okay, now I am in an agricultural, you know, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what the difference between suburbs and exurbs is, but I am on the far fringe of the San Francisco Bay Area. Is up until the late, eight, 1989, this town got its first stoplight. So what does that <laughs> tell you? And so we're a small city of 65,000 people. I had heard that pot brownies didn't taste so great, especially if you were a chocolate fanatic like myself and i won't mention any names but one of our local farmers said well you've never tried my version and i was like oh my you know like you get once you mention it everybody comes out of the woodwork which is really interesting but you know well the, the actually one of the things that's i think very important in terms of particularly uh, a minor political point here is the difference between legalization and decrim uh, that with legalization, you have properly labeled uh, thing so that you know what you're getting. Uh, the problem with brownies in, uh, in the good old days was that you just didn't know your dosage. And uh, I remember going with a couple of friends, this would have been uh, the um, uh, circa 1970, uh, whatever it was, when the movie 2001 uh, first uh, came out. And this is one of those movies where the, uh, the, you, know, you have to see that stone. Oh, so okay. <laughs> it's a long movie. 
and so uh, we we smoke a doobie, and then have a brownie, and then go in for the movie. The idea is about the time the doobie wore off, the brownies would kick in, and That's funny. that happened. Except that we got the munchies and ate the rest of the brownies, <laughs> and had to go back to see the movie again. <laughs> <laughs> it was, that was, that was, it, it was better was, the first time, but more oh. memorable the second time. <laughs> that was one thing I was going to ask you, is I know, like, my mom, at the, let's see, about the last six months of her life, maybe even a little bit less, was having a lot of trouble eating. And I know a, one problem that people in advanced Alzheimer's have is... You know, they see the food, but their brain doesn't register it as food. Yep. And I'm wondering if actual marijuana, since it gives you the munchies, if you think, and this is just your personal opinion, not a medical opinion, if you think that might help them to want to eat. It, well, it, I honestly don't know. Uh, I, I think that uh, one of the things, again, is that yes it will you know we know uh, from uh, observation that uh, for example that people uh, and this one of the things that ultimately led to the recognition of the medical properties of, of cannabis was the AIDS epidemic particularly in San Francisco and one of the things that uh, you know people uh, who are sick, regardless of what it is, may have a loss of appetite. And of course, on top of that, if you're nauseous, so a little or a lot, then again, uh, this uh, cannabis we know helps with that. And one of the really heartbreaking stories from the early days of the AIDS uh, epidemic was that it was recognized in the gay community that there was uh, the people who were uh, dying, of course, in, those, in the early days of the AIDS uh, epidemic, that it killed a lot faster uh, than it did, uh, which is fairly typical of, you know, and hopefully will be true of, of COVID as well. But uh, the, uh, it was, you know, they looked around, it's, it's obvious that the people who were dying the fastest were people who had been living in the fast lane, uh, that, you know, se you know uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, with or without the rock and roll. And so uh, that uh, the, there were groups that, of patients that uh, people with AIDS who were uh, really trying to figure out anything, you know, because nobody just did, just did like COVID didn't make any sense. And so uh, they, but they really, one of the groups called ACT UP and they were acting up because nobody was taking it seriously. You know, we're dying and you're not paying, you know, taking it seriously. This is particularly a problem during uh, Reagan's first term. But the idea was that, uh, you know, sort of like AA, that we're gonna swear off all drugs. And that was a really good thing, except that they also were swearing off of marijuana. And so the group, uh, basically split in two. Those that were continued to use marijuana for medical purposes. And um, it's still hard for me to, to relate this guy's explanation. He says, we won the argument because the other side all died. Mm. That uh, the, the, the life expectancy of people with full-blown AIDS before any really effective treatment, it was really obvious that cannabis you know, improved the quality of life. And one of the main reasons was that, again, they were, there was a wasting disease that was basically because they couldn't eat. Yeah. And so, and so the, you know, everybody, I mean, the munchies are a big joke unless you have, you know, something that has destroyed your appetite and, and you're nauseous all the time. And then it is, uh, you know, and this, so, you know, to the, the things that cannabis might do uh, to help, you know, the patient with AIDS who as you say may not even recognize the food at that point is that if they're less stressed 
and it, and and they get a uh, you know if you they aren't going to tell you they're nauseous. They're not going to tell you they, they cannot tell you that you know right now they're not hungry, or I'm hungry. But if they have you know if that is the problem, then uh, whole cannabis in terms of of with the THC because it's the THC that gives you the munchies. Uh, 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 but uh, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely something that I think would be, you know, worth exploring. Uh, but back, to, you know, but really, really important thing is that with, you know, legal cannabis, you can go to a dispensary and you can get 10 milligram squares of chocolate. Tastes really good. <laughs> Being wicked here. <laughs> Chalk. Yeah, and I haven't had lunch, so, so you're really giving me the... <laughs> I'm being mean. <laughs> I'm being mean. Let's see. But, uh, you know, that's... Uh, but, you know, again, going back to the other aspect of it is, is in terms of the stress on the family, the caregivers, uh, that dealing with people with really severe problems. Uh, and it's, you know, the... The emotional strain of not having your mother recognize you, uh, you know that sort of thing, uh, and then you know being frightened of you and this sort of thing. Uh, so it, it's it, that, in terms of just general something to look into, would be it. Well, you know, CBD uh, really does not seem to have any really significant side effects. Uh, one of the things I want to emphasize about that is. The, the way to, you know, I think that everybody would be, you know, particularly if you're dealing with, uh, you know, the family and, and the patients with Alzheimer's is, you know, start off with uh, a, a few drop, you know, a, a dropper uh, and uh, then wait and see uh, if, you know, if there's any discernible effect. If not, you know, go for, you know, two next time and this sort of thing. And, you know, because again, there is no lethal dose uh, that, you know, pe people can get too stoned at the wrong time and do all, all kinds of, of really uh, uh, dumb things, you know, including, you know, accidents and so on. But there has never been a, a fatal overdose of cannabis. And that's more than you can say for aspirin and uh, acetaminophen and any number of over-the-counter drugs. But with, some of which, by the way, have really bad effects on uh, cognitive function as, as as people get older. And uh, one, you know, just in terms of over-the-counter drugs, not talking about prescription drugs, just over-the-counter drugs uh, that can have uh, psychoactive effects or something like that. That you know, by the way, I was amused to see this morning's news. Tylenol, acetaminophen, is associated with risk-taking behavior. What? <laughs> uh, well, I'd have enough risk-taking behavior. With that, but it's like I, I take Tylenol because I have a headache or some other pain. Do you like, want to go out and get wild after you? No. Your... <laughs> I'm thinking <laughs> if well, I'm not pleasant when I have a really bad headache. So I guess you could be, I think that's the opposite. I don't know who's saying that, but that's, that's nuts. Well, I, I, uh, uh, it's the latest research. So it must be true. This is yeah, right. the talk that which is actually another uh, peeve, to put it mildly, of mine is that over the decades that I've been involved with uh, the cannabis reform movement, it was always, well, the latest research shows uh, you know, that if you give enough of it to mice, you know, mice drop out of school. You know, I mean, there's just, you know, uh, but it, it's, if you, or then you read the fine print that the National Institute of Drug Abuse provided the funding. And then if you read the conclusion is, you know, that this particular problem is associated with marijuana use, but we need to do more research. So send another check. Yeah. And I, I this, you know, sounds very cynical and partisan and so on, but I really think that basically the National Institute of Drug Abuse was buying press releases. That they, the, well, an example going back to San Francisco and AIDS, um, 
Dr. Donald Abrams, who is, uh, was at San Francisco general for many years and may still be still active, um, for several years tried to get a, a, a grant and approval to do uh, research to see if marijuana, medical marijuana, would help uh, AIDS patients. Every year, they, they would say no. So we suggested that he submit his uh, proposal. We'll see if it hurts AIDS patients. Checks in the mail, right there, we'll get you the marijuana and so on. So uh, he gets this grant and, and by the way, the federal government controls the supply of marijuana. You, 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 any other drug you want to do research on, you get the funding, you can get the approval, but they don't, uh, you, you can get the, the drug in question wherever. But if you're going to do it with marijuana, you have to get it from the, uh, uh, the DEA and IDA. Uh, but anyway. From Kentucky, he, right? Hmm? The marijuana comes from Kentucky. Uh, Louisiana. Louisiana. Uh, but okay. uh, the, the, uh, it, it probably tastes better. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, uh, he got the approval and he got, I think it was 30 patients, put them in a hospital for, uh, and half, you know, double blind. So half of them were given a placebo and half of them were given cannabis. And uh, the, uh, they were, you know, locked up for 30 days so that you know, they could do a re you know, real test. In the 30 days, uh, the results were disastrous. It turns out that not only did marijuana not harm people with AIDS, they actually felt better. And, and most alarming of all, there was even a drop in their viral count. Now, I'd never that, heard that. That it wasn't a big thing because again, they were only doing it for 30 days and it was not, but that wasn't it. But they actually did have a drop in the viral thing. So, he never got another grant. <laughs> Lord. Uh, uh, you know, this is, this is, you know, and it is in fact the law, this, which they may be finally about to amend, that the basically, as I say, gave the government a total monopoly on the, uh, the access to cannabis for medical research. And the law actually uh, prohibits the federal government from doing anything that might encourage legalization of any illegal drug, including cannabis. So the you know the out you may do all the research that you want to as long as you promise to come up with the results that uh, make prohibition work. And uh, you know there's um, you know even at my age I'm not cynical yet <laughs> Be because basically because we're winning. You know I mean uh, the the truth will make us free. And it, it, but it is really, uh, you know, even to this day, uh, it is very frustrating to see, you know, the government still trying to block uh, legalization cannabis, blocking medical research. And, uh, and of course, all of it come accompanied by, let's talk about freedom and wave a flag. Uh, you know, and, and you know, you ain't gonna make me wear a mask. It's a free country. I can not go, you know, I don't have to wear shoes, shoes and shirts to get service. <laughs> uh, hypocrisy and, is a, uh, it's a vast, there's a vast quantity of hypocrisy available these days. I don't know if I'm just more aware of it or if there's more of it or both, but yeah, I'm with you. You know, cause well, I, I'm in California. I, I, I was We've got in the old South. So I uh, believe me, I know about hypocrisy. <laughs> Well, I think it's interesting. Some of my best friends are hypocrites. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we all are a little bit. So let me let me ask you a question before we get. Sure. Before we have a two hour conversation and I'm like chewing on my arm because, like I said, I haven't <laughs> had lunch. Um, now CBD does not have the THC in it, correct? Uh, THC and CBD are two entirely different cannabinoids. Both of them uh, occur in various degrees in. Uh, the uh, hemp that is that doesn't meet the U. Well, actually, there's small traces of THC in legal hemp in the United States, but uh, that they there are something like 80 different cannabinoids, and they uh, it was uh, T 
THC really wasn't discovered until the 60s. And, uh, and it was not discovered by a hippie. Uh, it was actually discovered by a scientist in, um, in Israel, who is, by the way, still, uh, still at it. Um, but uh, he uh, uh, and others, they began to determine, you know, you know what's in this thing. And uh, so now they, like I said, there may be 80 different cannabinoids, but uh, CBD, again, uh, the government's owned about CBD since the 70s. Uh, and, uh, but it was not available in, you know, in, in sufficient quantities. And, and of course, the fact that it was associated with marijuana, uh, it came from the evil plant, uh, that, you know, you, uh, that they blocked access to that too. But you know, there's a CBD, and a CBG, a CBN, and so on. And uh, the, these cannabinoids in there are the uh, terpenes that uh, seem that there's a huge debate over this, but it now seems the terpenes actually have some sort of, of medical value. Uh, and so basically ca cannabinoid medicine is going to be, if the government will just get out of the way, uh, is, you know, is going to be a, is, or in fact it really already is, a major area for research going forward. And you know, it really, I mean, but the government uh, is still doing everything they can, even, you know, in terms of threatening CBD. Uh, Mark Meadows, uh, the uh, Trump's chief of staff, uh, when he was in Congress, opposed, you know, even CBD. He is a prohibitionist. Uh, and uh, the, this is uh, something that, you know, again, we're going to see a debate on this in the next uh, day, a few days in the Congress to see. But, you know, the, unfortunately, the Trump administration has basically uh, been staffed with prohibitionists. And they don't, of course, it began, I mean, Jeff Sessions, who was his first choice for uh, Attorney General, uh, it was you know, a rabid prohibitionist. And, uh, and, and so you, and of course, uh, unfortunately, it, the new attorney general Barr is also, and he is, uh, you know, is threatening California, uh, uh, even legal operators in California, and he wanted to do an antitrust case against some of the bigger uh, CBD companies. Uh, and you know, at the very beginning, I mean, most of these companies, their stocks fall by eighty or ninety percent. So if they have some sort of monopoly, they are not doing it very well. <laughs> it's. Uh, but the, yeah, anyway, the point being is, is that the government is still blocking access to cannabinoid medicine. And just uh, nuts. So, uh, but in the, in the case of CBD, and, there, and there's still, I can't remember which states, but there's still a few states where you can't even get CBD. And, uh, Not this one. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, that's one of the great things about California. You got the money, honey. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, by the way, it's going to be really, I'm back home in Texas right now, and the legislature is going to go into this session uh, right after the, the first of the year, maybe. Uh, and uh, Texas, uh, by that point, Mexico, where, by the way, CBD is legal, uh, Mexico is going to completely legalize cannabis, and not medical and recreational. And so with uh, Texas at that point will be surrounded by states that have you know, either medical or, or legal uh, marijuana. And uh, it, so Texas will be a huge market for the new and improved Mexican marijuana. <laughs> Everything old is new again. That is so funny. So a quick yeah. question, and then I'm gonna turn us back towards Alzheimer's. Sure. What's the point of all this prohibition? I mean, my husband used to smoke, very big beer and wine drinker, won't even touch my little mints that are five milligrams of THC each. So they're, I'm not even sure they're a glass of wine for somebody like him. I got them to stay calm and kind of in mom's reality while I was visiting with her. And I wanted a lowest dose because sometimes we drove places and I didn't want to be driving impaired. So I was trying to be, trying to be a responsible person. He will not even consider the, the adult 
uh, marshmallows for adult s'mores or my mints, but 12 pack of beer every day is okay. Like, I don't understand. It's like, to me, it's the same. Drinking beer, pot, I don't see a huge difference. So what's with this, what's all with the prohibition? Is it just our crazy Puritan culture from way back in the 1600s or I'm not a good- No, I think it's, it's more like the 60s. Uh, America had, a, a, there, there was a huge uh, social division in the 60s. Uh, you know, the uh, growing up, uh, I, uh, you know, in the 50s uh, and, everything i mean there's some wonderful pictures like willie nelson wearing a coat and tie uh yeah <laughs> uh, i make it a like shocked face because i yeah. cannot picture that <laughs> uh, well exactly or you know the beat poets in greenwich village we're all coat wearing coats and ties uh and uh it was simply the way things were done and uh but the social division and the political divisions in the 60s caused marijuana to be associated with uh, hippies uh, and so general nonconformity. Uh, and of course, op uh, uh, generally sp speaking, even though the Democrats didn't want anything to do with them, the hippies liked Democrats. Uh, uh, you know, Dianne Feinstein, who had just turned 90, uh, finally, came, uh, uh, I mean, one of the most left-wing members of the United States Senate, she finally came out against marijuana prohibition. She's former mayor of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, but, you know, I, the idea of, of, you know, I've had people who like, you know, really like to drink and, you know, I suggest, you know, oh no, I have enough trouble with this drug. <laughs> and so I think that, and that is, uh, you, know, you know, if the, you know, well, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I. Uh, I love alcohol. In fact, wine may be my favorite drug. Uh, but uh, it, it is one thing, of course, as I get older, it takes less of wine to, to, uh, for my occasional infirmities. Um, but I, I just, I think that it really is it's a combination of social factors. And then again, somebody who does use a lot of alcohol thinks, well, I don't need anything else. But uh, on the other hand, uh, at some point or other, it, uh, the damage from the alcohol may necessitate medical cannabis. And I'm not wishing that on anybody. Uh, and believe me, it ain't either or. <laughs> That's funny. Well, my whole attitude is once they figure out they can tax it and make money, they'll, they'll flip the switch. Is it well, nice? unfortunately, they, they have this idea that it's going to be a cash cow for them which uh, then means they want to tax it so that legal weed is not competitive with the black market. And that has been a big problem in California, but in really most of the other states is the black market continues. Now, I, we don't, the, the really, the most important thing about getting rid of the black market or making it, reducing it is that in the Netherlands, you have been able to go into coffee shops for like since the 19th, mid 70s uh, and buy cannabis. In the early days, it was all hashish. Uh, now it is uh, mostly uh, Dutch, Spanish, Eastern European wheat weed. Uh, and one thing that you will never ever find in a coffee shop is hard drugs. The, uh, the, they, the Dutch call it separation of the markets. So that when you go to the a black market marijuana seller, he may or may not, I mean, most, most of them that I've known there would not have had cocaine, but if, you know, if, as, as you move into uh, more unstable areas, shall we say, they are most likely to have, you know, poly drugs. And so, you know, heroin, cocaine, meth, whatever. And uh, even at, at the wholesale level back, uh, uh, decades ago, when the uh, Colombians at one point become a major source of marijuana, particularly if you remember Miami Vice, uh, that was uh, 
uh, about Don Johnson, and ironically, Cheech, <laughs> Cheech Marin. Cheech <laughs> Yep. <laughs> but uh, the uh, the reason that Miami uh, Miami had become a major source of Colombian weed. Uh, Northern Colombia produces some really great weed. Mexico had been poisoned by Paraquat and, uh, uh, and the Mexican weed was really bad. So the Colombians get into the business. Um, and uh, some point uh, in the early 80s, about the time that George uh, Herbert Walker Bush became president, uh, that the boats coming up from Colombia suddenly you wanted marijuana, you had to buy cocaine. They basically forced cocaine into the distribution system for marijuana from Colombia. That is uh, the way black markets work. So uh, the, the, this is, is why uh, you know, legalization is important, why it is also important to minimize the black market so that you don't have uh, you know, poly drug sellers on the street. You know, what you do about the hard drugs after that, that's a separate topic. Yeah. But you do, but you want to separate the markets. Okay, well, since I'm in California, and I believe you can get a lot of this on the internet. I don't know, I'm sure it's, every state has its own laws. And I don't even know about my listeners that are in Canada and the UK, and I do have some in Mexico, so I guess they know what, what's coming down the line for them. One of the issues, there's several issues with Alzheimer's that are pretty common. Thankfully, not everybody has to deal with aggression. And that is that was the problem I was trying to solve with my mom. One of it, I was trying to get her neurologist to take her off of the Alzheimer's medications because from what I had learned, and she was the neurologist was trying to tell me differently, so I'm not sure if she was steering me in the direction she wanted to go or if if the jury is still out on this but they from what i've learned some of the alzheimer's like the cognitive enhancing medications after about five years do not help and can make you aggressive she was getting let's see she'd been on them i gotta do math like eight years and i i think her aggression was just from the disease and it's and it's essentially what killed her she jerked away from the caregiver that was there was two of them helping her shower reached for her clothes slipped landed on her knee and broke her leg and two and a half weeks later was gone so my sister and i independently tried to figure out how to use cbd to calm the aggression to calm the anxiety the problem was getting her off the other drugs and then getting the professional staff to essentially medicate her with something that wasn't prescribed by a doctor. So that was my challenge. But what, what do you suggest maybe people who are caring for loved ones at home, or maybe even people that were in our situation, what we should consider trying? She was pretty mellow the day I gave her half of, this was half a pot brownie? I think it was a quarter of a pot brownie. That I got from well, my cycle club friend. <laughs> one of the things to think about, for example, is that um, if you uh, just really make it simple, the police get called to bars all the time for violence. Uh, and the and, and going back to the Dutch example, they never get called to a coffee shop. Uh, that uh, you know. It, um, you know, there, I was almost always a nice drunk. Uh, you know, that there are, uh, and you hear, I mean, yeah, yeah, he's a really good guy, but he's a nasty drunk. And you hear, uh, but you know, you, you really never hear about anybody being a nasty stoner. Uh, and it, it's the fact is, is that, you know, it is a mild sedative among other things. What it is doing inside your body other than that, of course, the fact that, and this is one of the things that suggests that CBD and uh, THC, whole cannabis, uh, and could be useful in the actual treatment of, uh, of Alzheimer's is, you know, the fact it is 
uh, an, the drug is an anti-inflammatory. And so it does have uh, physical effects. It isn't just that uh, you're getting uh, you're, 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 you're getting high and, and mellow, uh, and, you know, but, you know, mellow is good and particularly, you know, in that particular context. And so, and I think that one of the things, for example, you know, you can, whether it's tea or, uh, a, a brownie sharing it with the, uh, the patient and, you know, the, uh, just and see what happens in terms of, of course again depending on how uh, far along they're they're going if you know this if that's sharing it is, is a meaningful concept but you know just to to but dealing with the stress that all of the people involved are feeling now the big problem is that that despite uh, all of the progress that uh, we have made uh, in terms of getting you know some recognition from the medical establishment for the most part it is simply you know see no weed hear no weed speak no weed uh they they you know, they are locked into this paradigm and uh it is very difficult and i'm, and I'm very sympathetic with uh, the alzheimer society and the other uh, official disease groups that they have to deal with the medical establishment and the federal government and various, uh, you know, international groups and so on. And uh, it's really, they get down to the point of, uh, oh, of course you can talk about cannabis, but not here, you know. And that's, uh, and, you know, uh, the story about one of the, the most disturbing conversations that I had when I was at Normal many years ago. Um, well, first I'll tell you one really quick one is that I got a call one day from a young man and he, I thought, I thought he was just, you know, really stoned, uh, but you know, he's speaking very slowly. And so well, it turns out he had serious mental issues. And so he had been really miserable. Uh, and I don't know what, what the doctors were giving him, but you know, so we were talking about things and the doctor wouldn't talk to him about the marijuana. And so he's, well, so I, he's, you know, he's calling normal uh, to, you know, to get our, our unbiased opinion. Uh, but the thing that he said right at the end of the conversation that shook me still does, I haven't tried to kill myself since I started using marijuana. Those are exact words. After we hung up, I cried. I walked, we were, the office was just a couple blocks from the White House. They, 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 <laughs> uh, the, the staff generally knew what I, I get up, walk out, walk across to the White House and glower. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate. Great word. <laughs> I glowered menacingly uh, because the SOB in the White House said, yeah, I didn't inhale. Well, I knew better. I mean, I knew he was lying. Uh, I don't know how you but, can smoke and not inhale. That takes talent. Well, how can you, how can you be a president without lying? Um, yeah. <laughs> That's a whole other podcast. <laughs> we leave that message to another time. But, uh, you know, it really, you know, the, the idea is that I was saying about this, uh, I got a call one day again, uh, early in the morning, I was like, I got there early. Uh, and this woman whose father was, um, uh, basically dying of cancer in very bad shape but they, so they were doing chemo and uh, he was vomiting so violently that uh, they were very concerned about it and there are pharmaceutical anti-emetics but if you read the label they don't work all the time and sometimes uh, uh, they work the first few times and then stop working and so this old guy was retching his life away and the nurse actually says the, the, to the guy's daughter my father had the same problem and we gave him marijuana and he was okay and so she asks the doctor and he, he says i don't want to even talk about it and walks it storms out of the room and so 
she's calling me. She went, she, she threw, you know, uh, some of her other, worked up enough courage to go get some weed someplace. And she's calling me, the National Director of Normal, <laughs> uh, on, 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 it was good Friday morning, because uh, I, I will never forget that. Uh, and she is asking me, well, I said, what is, you know, like, how can I, she says, well, I just, we just don't want to give him a, you know, I don't want to kill him, don't want to give him a lethal dose. How much can we safely give him? And uh, I said, you know, I told her there is no lethal dose. And she was so relieved. She also was so paranoid she wouldn't give me her first name. <laughs> and uh, she was calling me from a hospital that was within sight of uh, the place where the Star Spangled Banner was written about the land of the free and the home of the brave. And she's afraid to give me her name. She wants to find out if a plant is going to kill her father who is dying of cancer. And she's afraid. Not, I mean, and that, as I say, I remember that so well because one, it was on Good Friday and she was calling from within sight of the, where the Star Spangled Banner was written. That is a neat story. Yeah. And, you know, this is, again, to me, uh, I, uh, I just, I believe in personal autonomy. I believe that, you know, uh, the, you know, that we, if, if we don't own our own bodies, if we do not, if we, if we cannot, you know, have say over something of the sort of thing that we're talking about right now, uh, to help, you know, patients with Alzheimer's, help families uh, with, uh, you know, who are dealing with this. And, and I certainly don't need to tell you anything about that. And, but the, the idea that you could be arrested for using a plant to help people is, uh, you know, just un, you know, unimaginable, but I don't have to imagine it. You know, it's, I've, I've you know, I, I, you know, I know I had two friends who were driven to suicide who did kill themselves mm -hmm. because they were suffering so much. And when they were going to be put in jail for using the one thing that was helping them, they killed themselves. That's not good. That, yeah. And so when you ever hear, well, we haven't done enough research on marijuana. We don't know. But if that, you know, and I always say, what kind of research have you done on arresting people? Yeah, what, what, that's what? true. And yeah, and this is you know, the idea is well, you know, in order to to recommend a you know a, a drug, we have to do research on it. And I said, well, have you done research on arresting people? And well, no, that's your policy. That's what you're doing. That's what you, as a physician, are advocating. Yeah, yeah. That with more research, sure, but stop arresting people until you know the, until you've done your research on arrests. Yeah, for real. We've arrested 22 million Americans for marijuana charges since Nixon was in office. 22 million. We'll arrest, this year, we'll arrest 600,000 people on marijuana possession charges, and that's more Americans than will be arrested for all of the violent crimes put together. That's insane. Yeah. Because yeah, I don't think, I mean, obviously people that are on hard drugs, we're going off, we're very veered into the political podcast today, which is, I like to listen to, but I don't generally produce. <laughs> <laughs> um, people like on the hard stuff, Coke and meth and heroin, I guess. I don't have any experience with any of those. So, you know, they're generally causing more problems than somebody that's doing marijuana. That's, po that's Portugal. Portugal has decriminalized possession of everything in small quantities. Uh, and uh, the, but you know, uh, the alcohol and uh, alcohol and other hard drugs, uh, uh, you know, cause, you know, all kinds of social problems. And, yet we don't arrest people for possession of alcohol. Um, and uh, that the, the idea is that these, the people, and particularly the thing we're doing, going through right now, 
is that there had been a downtrend on opiate overdoses. Uh, that is unfortunately is reversed. And again, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I think everybody, it's obvious that this is related to COVID, that this is simply the stress mm -hmm. of COVID is, is you know, the, the, these are the people who are, I guess, most vulnerable to stress. Uh, uh, but they, uh, you know, the overdoses uh, are something that these are, these deaths are, most of them are preventable. Uh, and uh, the idea if particularly, you know, in the old days of, of heroin distribution, uh, often owned in various countries, including the UK, uh, various times tried, you know, treating a, a heroin addiction as a, uh, a medical condition. And uh, the, it is weird, but heroin, uh, if you, it, people once can actually stabilize the thing. And, it, you know, they don't always come off of it. It would be nice if they did, but they are able to lead normal lives uh, if they have uh, heroin maintenance, it's called. And if you, uh, Vancouver is an incredibly lovely city and I was there for about five years. It was a very strange thing is that uh, just blocks from some of the nicest areas and just within blocks of Chinatown, you would see, uh, uh, never see a Chinese uh, heroin addict. Uh, you would ever see a Chinese addict, you ever see a Chinese beggar on the streets and those days. Uh, but one block over uh, Anglos and native uh, Canadians, uh, you would see the most horrible scenes of addiction you can imagine. And the thing about it was, was how utterly chaotic their lives were because they could not plan around anything that you know, their whole life was about scoring. And they, you know, that becomes the center of their life. And that is, uh, you know, is, yes, it's a function of addiction, but it is also a function of simply criminalizing uh, what is really a, a terrible you know, disorder. And uh, of course, again, this is never a part of, of the marijuana world. Uh, except when they end up in the same markets and your guy, your pot dealer tries to sell your heroin. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, but anyway, <laughs> well, so we've, I'm really, we've, I keep getting political on you. Yeah, that's okay. Well, <laughs> I hope it's okay. <laughs> I do have a lot of California listeners, so hopefully well, you haven't the death offended anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked a lot about using cannabis or CBD or you tell me which one or both to mitigate stress to not, I don't want to say relieve it. Maybe that is the right word, but to manage our stress, which, you know, right now a lot of us could use. Yes. Um, and you think the family member, like a family caregiver taking care of somebody with Alzheimer's, this is something they should partake in together or this should be the family caregiver doing more of the partaking. Well, first off, uh, you know, as you explained, I'm in the CBD business. So, uh, yes, it, 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 I would, in the sense that there are no really major side effects or anything like that, uh, that uh, if you have, if you're having issues, try CBD in the sense that, and, and, you know, start off with small doses and see, uh, and, you know, if, if if you keep on increasing the doses and your problems don't go away, then uh, stop wasting your money on CBD. Uh, but uh, the idea is that this is something where it is so low risk you know, that uh, this, uh, in the sense that a whole cannabis, you know, again, no amount of it's going to kill you. Uh, but uh, <laughs> one of the things that, you know, people who are, you know, unfamiliar with it, you know, they have too much and uh, panic, uh, and, you know, they're extremely uncomfortable, uh, and it is uncomfortable. I, I have a few times, had a little more, are we talking about alcohol or what? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, the, 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 it really, you know, in terms of uh, <laughs> the old commercial, try it, you like it, uh, but, you know, again, uh, start small, with small doses, and and 
uh, and see, and then, uh, and the same would be true for both the caretaker and the patient. Now, uh, I, I, I will not, you know, make the same kind of just flat recommendation for whole cannabis. That uh, the that some people are uh, become extremely uncomfortable with, uh, you know, just getting too stoned, and um, yeah, you know, been there, done that too. So, uh, you know, the fact is that you, as as with THC, you know, start with small doses, the smallest dose, like your five milligram thing, and so on, and also, the thing that to remember is that whenever you're taking an edible, uh, it may take an hour or so to uh, kick in. So don't do what I did in 2001 and eat all the brownies and see what happened. <laughs> I've heard uh, those stories. Yeah. I, it, well, as I say, the second time I saw it and remembered it, it was a really good movie. Um, <laughs> wonder how Hal's doing these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I did when I, see, I went to Colorado a year ago-ish, and so I got to pick, I went to um, Mountain Medicinals, and I picked their brain. I told them what, what was going on with my mom and what was going on with me, and because they understood that legally you're not allowed to take it on the airplane, and somebody who will remain nameless at the moment told me not to worry about that in future. That I, I can, I can wink, drive wink, the, nudge, nudge. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was before my city has a moratorium against dispensaries, which is very frustrating because I keep telling them, you know, sales tax is a good thing. We would like sales tax, but it's okay. They're, we'll put bars on every corner and yes, nail places that, on that, every that'll corner. That'll solve all our problems. Yeah, Probably we'll get more tax revenue. Uh, maybe I don't know. CBD is not cheap, but I can now go next town over, and I I have um our best friend's son has gone to this particular dispensary, so <laughs> I, I I don't need to pick brains, but it's it's helpful to you know talk to them. I mean they're oh, well, but, they're knowledgeable. Any, they're not any like good dispensary there will they they will be people knowledgeable there. Uh, they're called something is usually called bud tenders, which I think is really cute. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, uh, they're not, again, they're not doctors, but they, they get a lot of feedback and, you know, a lot of this is, you know, is really fairly straightforward, uh, that, um, uh, and of course, a lot of it is also sort of myth. The, uh, nobody really thinks there's any difference between indica and sativa, uh, uh, yeah, it's really, uh, there's no scientific basis for that. Um, but uh, the, just generally speaking, you know, it is, you definitely go about it the right way. You go to a dispensary and uh, get, uh, uh, you know, talk to somebody who's knowledgeable. And again, buy in uh, the smallest uh, doses that you can, uh, because you can always take more. Uh, I would, generally speaking, uh, I would buy uh, CBD uh, separately from THC because if you get, dispensaries have high overheads. Uh, and uh, so, the, and also there's a, a, you know, more of a tax on, uh, on uh, THC. So that if you, buy a, if you buy them separately in the sense that first off uh you could probably get uh, cbd cheaper online or at uh, or at other or just regular stores because they they take a less of a markup and uh the, but yeah you know, and then get your thc at a, a marijuana dispensary uh and then you can combine them or take them separately uh that uh Sometimes the uh, high THC stuff uh, will also have CBD in it. But again, that's the key thing about legalization is you get labels that tell you what you're getting. And they're pretty good about that. It, it, we have a testing company and, you know, occasionally we find uh, that they have too much THC in the CBD or they have, you know, again, it's like quality control anyplace else. They're quality control fails. But 
for the most part, you know, you're, it's, you're not getting anything dangerous, uh, that, uh, you know, particularly not you know, in, in any given dose. So I, I would, you know, I think that's probably the best way to do it. But you definitely did the right thing going to the dispensary for, and getting advice. Well, yeah, and it's, it was, like I said, I'm not, I don't drink because I like to eat chocolate. It's not, not a, <laughs> it's, not, it's a, a calorie decision, not in any kind of moral, you know, I have no prohibition against it. Although I do think a lot of our friends drink too much. Maybe they don't do <laughs> cannabis enough. I don't know. Maybe that'll be a conversation for another day. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, I knew exactly what I was trying to achieve personally and they were very good about it. And they, these mints take about 20 to 30 minutes to kick in and they are not yeah. kidding. Like 30 minutes. It's like, you know, okay, it's kicked in now. And I think I've only taken two once or twice. There was a day recently where everything was irritating me. It was like every nerve was getting rubbed raw. I don't know what was going on. The dog Turn off breathing. The television. <laughs> no, I wasn't even watching TV. I don't know. It was just life, you know, pandemic and yeah. like oh, the same wall. A lot of Americans can relate to that these days. Yeah. So I finally, at the end of the day, I was like, you know, I still just wanted to like punch people, which is completely not my personality. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, I have those mints. So I went, got them out of my purse and took two and, ah. <sighs> <laughs> everything stopped irritating me and i slept really really good and then i was mad that i didn't th remember to do that earlier in the day because this is <laughs> really i've never experienced that before i've never experienced that since thankfully but now if i do i know exactly what to do and now the mints are not in my purse or in the bathroom because i don't need them obviously for my mom because she's gone but one last a very important question and i hope people have gotten all the way to the end of this because i think I might have to tag this onto the front. And I hope you know the answer to this one. The reason I tried to get my mom off of her pharmaceuticals was two, twofold. One was because I don't think they were doing any good. But I didn't want to introduce CBD or anything with THC in it on top of pharmaceuticals for fear of really weird interaction. And I'm getting the impression, and I don't know why, that that is not necessarily something to worry about. Am I wrong? Well, I, first of all, it would, it depends. Uh, the, <laughs> That's the answer uh, to everything in my life. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's the answer to everything in my life except underwear, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good joke. So, so far, so good. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, the uh, that there is a prospect possibility of interactions uh particularly uh with thc more than cbd but uh, again the key thing there is start with a a small dose of uh, the cbd and the, the uh and you know if there are no problems and 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 uh, but no obvious benefits, you know, increase the dose of, you know, a, you know, a little bit every day. And then uh, if you, if you, if there, if it doesn't work or if there are problems, then stop. But there's really, there, the problem, one of the things that we have really have a problem is that particularly uh, people with Alzheimer's or, you know, people my generation generally, is that 90% uh, of the people my age are on a prescription drug at least one and the and how these drugs interact is something that we don't know anywhere near enough about and every time you add another one then you add more variables then and then and so particularly you know you get up three four five and you know how is cbd going to interact with a combination of a b and c and uh nobody knows and that's, that's true. you know that's a problem with or without uh, cannabinoids and that really is a thing see but again you know start do it easy just start with small doses and, and increase and see what happens because it you know it's it's not going to kill you well that's a good 
That's probably a good place to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Not being dead is a good place to start. <laughs> yeah, that is very true. You know, uh, as many of my listeners know, my paternal grandmother is 102. Her mind is still really good. She does repeat one story fairly regularly, but not, she repeats it every time I see, visit her. I don't see her. She's mostly blind, but she doesn't repeat it three times while I'm there. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I probably repeated two stories while we were talking today. So. <laughs> Which is normal. You know, I just, the, there was a story my mom repeated all the time and I got really, really good at disrupting the narrative and if i couldn't disrupt her and get her onto a different topic then i could i could pivot talking she would she would always tell me about how when she was pregnant with her first which was me that my paternal grandmother said oh well now you'll be getting rid of the dogs right well that pissed <laughs> my mom off so bad okay i'll be 54 in november of this year 2020 my mom had advanced Alzheimer's and that story kept coming out. And unfortunately, sometimes it came out when my paternal grandmother was around. So, <laughs> yeah, talk about uncomfortable moments. So I, if I could not knock her off of that track, out of that groove, then I could sometimes pivot and start asking her questions about her dogs, any dogs, my dogs, and, and move it along. But so, yeah, thankfully, you have not done that to me. My grandmother does not do that to me. <laughs> well, by the way, I will leave this with you in parting. CBD is good for dogs. That's it true. Really I probably should try it with my old guy. He has nerve arthritis. Yeah. And he is on some, well, he gets a shot twice a month. He's on, um, he is on the same drug that some people take. And I'm not going to be able to remember the name. Um, but it's for nerve arthritis. But uh, Well, true. He'll love the CBD. Okay. You hear that, Jinx? <laughs> He's always close by, so I will definitely check into that for him because he pants a lot. He, well, is, if you just put the CBD drop, there there are actually some places actually sell CBD for, for pets. Uh, but you, on the other hand, you, know, you can just get a, a dropper bottle and put uh, CBD on their kibble and bits and uh, uh, that, that uh, it really does help. So. I'll so. definitely try it because he's getting to the point. He's almost 13, which is very old for a golden. And if he's not sleeping and he's not fully medicated, so right before, right after he's gotten his gabapentin, is one of the drugs, um, he just pants and he pants a lot. And he likes to pant really close to me. And, he, <laughs> and if you listen... Really, really, maybe if you turn your, turn this podcast up really loud, I don't know. I can't tell you all of them. Today's is probably one, but you <laughs> hear heavy breathing in the background <laughs> and it's just the dog. I'm not doing anything weird. <laughs> How disillusioning. <laughs> yeah, it's like, one of these days I'm going to have to put him on camera because there was one day I actually had to I was editing a podcast and I was like, all I hear is dog panting. It's driving me bananas. So I was about to move him out of the room. And when I stopped the recording, took the earbuds out, I'm like, oh crap, it's not the actual dog. It's the recorded dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's a little background on podcast life. Well, I appreciate yeah, this. This has been fascinating. Yeah, well, yeah we all dogs got to stick together so give them some C cbd <laughs> now you just give me more reasons much, to go yeah. to the the uh cocoa farms is what it's called here well not here in my town but in the next town over so have fun all righty you have a Enjoy good time it. in uh, texas and don't uh blow away or don't, don't come back to california until we stop having fires <laughs> oh god yeah it's just amazing Y'all have a good day now. Y'all come back thank now. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, dear. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.